today? Good. 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 Yeah, I know you don't normally expect something like that to come out of a guy dressed like this, right? So, but uh, my name's Todd Johnson. I'm a Savannah native, born and raised, and I have always been fascinated with uh, the evolution of arms and armor, and particularly how popular culture, movies, television, video games, portray stuff, which is unfortunately where a lot of the youth are getting their information, versus how it was in history. And so I've kind of made it my mission when I go to the games to set the record straight. And, you know, we think about, you know, when we're out there teaching and we're engaging the public and you see these kids out there and they have these notions of what a medieval soldier looked like because they saw a particular movie or they, you know, saw a particular TV show or they saw it in a video game. And although there was a lot of truth to it, there's a, there's a, there's a lot of stuff that just isn't quite right. And um, I am professionally a, a weapons and armor developer for the DOD. And so I've spent most of my, you know, I'm one of those lucky dudes that was able to take a passion from my youth and actually turn it into a job. And so this, this is a lot of fun to me. So whenever you see me out of the games, I'll usually be dressed in something like this and, uh, you know, trying not to injure people along the way. So when it comes to setting the record straight about, you know, especially with the youth, teaching them what the realities of the medieval battlefield were versus what they see in movies, I guess the best place to start is with this flower. <laughs> now, I have a love-hate relationship with Gibson's portrayal of William Wallace, and I'm not going to get all hung up on, on picking on him. Is he really as tall as me? I don't think he is. So at any rate, um, so, you know, it's one of those things where certainly, don't get me wrong, uh, popular media, modern media, has done a lot to kind of engage a younger audience and get them interested in this stuff and hopefully they'll do some research and learn some of the differences on their own. But often that's not the case. And so when we start thinking about what we see in, in a movie like this, um, first of all, the blue face paint, you know, uh, our earlier presenter mentioned uh, the pics. Uh, in order to find a warrior in blue face paint, you would have had to go back to the, the time of uh, the Roman Emperor Hadrian, who ruled in the mid-100s AD, and he was best known for a minor masonry project that cut Britannia in half at the waistline. And, uh, and it was meant to keep a, a certain barbarian uh, horde, I like to think of them as proto-Celts, um, <coughs> separate from the civilized people of the Roman Empire. So, needless to say, William Wallace would not have been seen and woed hundreds of years later, or they would have thought he was just absolutely out of his mind. And so, you know, and, and as far as kilts go, I mean, that was 300 years later. So when we start thinking about what did a medieval soldier of that period look like? Now, I'm not going to get all caught up in talking about the, the, the battles of Bannockburn, Sterling Bridge, and Falkirk. We know who won. We know who lost, and we generally know why. What I want to focus on is the equipment, the gear that these guys took out onto the battlefield and some of the tactics that they used to help keep them alive to fight another day. And so when we start thinking about the armor, um, one of the best things that we can do to try to get some clues as to what these guys look like, obviously we've got archaeological digs that help us put you know, some of the pieces together, but William Wallace in particular is a really good starting point because we tend to think of him you know, especially in the movie, the kids think of him as this every man, you know, who drew his armies from pure royalty, from Scottish independence and all that, from his kin. No. Um, Sir William was born into nobility. He had a lot of money, okay? And believe it or not, he built most of his armies from conscription. He was not beyond burning down houses and farms of those Scots who didn't comply. And the reason that's important is because it gives us a little bit of a clue as to what these guys brought to the field. So if you think about a conscript, you know, you're a farmer or a blacksmith, and the, these guys come knocking on your door and saying, hey, it's time to go fight Longshanks. What did you bring to the battlefield? Chances are, not much. You know, there, there might have been some farm implements, there might have been weapons that were handed down to your father or your grandfather, pieces that may have been gleaned from an earlier battle site. And so it was kind of a hodgepodge. The gear that I'm wearing right now is typical of a professional or semi-professional Scottish soldier. So William Wallace would have at least been wearing something like this and probably something like that, plate mail armor. And the reason is because he was important and he could afford to. Okay, so when you think about this, 
This is typical of 13th century Scottish heavy infantry. So I would have trained regularly. I would have been out there with my unit, usually drilling with what I consider to be probably the most iconic weapon in the Scottish battlefield, which was the pike. Now, who knows what this weapon was used for? Horses? It's an anti-cavalry weapon. What was the supreme weapon on the medieval battlefield at the time? Haggis. Yeah, so the, uh, the English knight on horseback. So you've got a very highly trained warrior in very expensive armor sitting atop an armored war horse, which is also highly trained. So you're looking at about 2,500 pounds of muscle and steel bearing down on you at 20 to 30 miles an hour. Not a happy place to be if you're a foot soldier like me. So what the typical Scottish foot soldier would do is they would form up with these pikes. And the whole idea, I don't want to take out the chain clear, the whole idea behind this weapon is that it would be planted and lowered to receive a cavalry charge. Now, what happens when all of that horse and knight hit this pole? If you're lucky, it pierces. If you're lucky, it pierces, and chances are this weapon is going to get broken. It's a disposable weapon. The army would typically travel with wagon loads of these, and if I was fortunate enough to survive the first charge, I've got my side on I would go back and fetch another pike and get back on the line. Okay, if I wasn't fortunate enough, you know, and, and think about it, these guys didn't ride in the battle solo. You had a row of, you know, you know, guys on horseback, knights, squires, all heavily armored, all highly trained, trained to work as a unit. One of the things that the English had going for them is that they had a, uh, they had a lot more experience out there on the battlefield. They had fought on foreign soils all over the place. And any good army is going to adopt what worked against them and fold it into their own army. So the whole time, you've got all these knights on horseback, and you also got other weapons that were brought into the game you know, by the English that they had you know, picked up in battles against their traditional enemies, the French glaive. This weapon right here was devastating. And one of the reasons this weapon was so important is you notice the hook. And you know, the Scots did the same thing. We adopted that hook as well. But this, the whole point of this weapon was not necessarily to slash not necessarily to stab, it was meant to hook a knight and drag him off of a horse and get him on the ground. Because once he's on the ground, he's vulnerable. So when you think about the professional soldier, you know, obviously there's an array of weapons that we have available to us. And when you think of the conscript, they're gonna be picking up whatever's available. And so when you go back to, uh, back to the supreme weapons on the battlefield, what was the, uh, what was the other weapon that the English were best known for? The longbow. Long now, I'm fortunate enough to have an actual English new longbow. You guys can pass this around if you want to take a look at it. Now, if anybody knows anything about archery, most bows, modern bows, are made out of laminates. You've got fiberglass, you've got wood, you've got composite materials, carbon fiber, things like that, that are laminated together, heat treated and pressured to create a tool that has varying flexibility. It's got denser materials and more springy materials, and the idea being is that it's able to deliver a, a lot of velocity and force, but it doesn't break in the process. One of the interesting things about you is that particular wood is a natural laminate. It has hardwood and it has surface wood that form a laminate that, you know, in modern times we have to make that with other materials. That particular bow would have been used by English archers who were actually started when they were like five, six years old. Um, they have found uh, uh, remains of English archers who had trained from very young ages and they actually had induced scoliosis uh, from pulling that bow for a lifetime. And some of these bows exceeded 90 to 100 pounds in draw weight. Now to put that in perspective, 90 to 100 pounds, anybody here ever pull a compound bow on a hunting trip? Um, yeah, there you go. So, Compound bows have this neat little cam system and when you draw it back, it gets to a point that it relaxes. And it's a lot easier to sit there in your deer stand and hold it out here and when you let go of it, it releases with 100 plus pounds of force. A 100 pound bow like that, you're pulling 100 pounds all the way back and you're holding it. Now, 
There was a demo I wanted to do in here, but without bringing ballistic shields in to protect you guys, we decided not to do it. Because we, we had about a 30% deflection rate where every time we tried to penetrate armor, it was going off in some wild direction, and I'm sure I wouldn't be real popular with the crowd. This is a typical breastplate that would have been made out of hardened steel, and you can see how thick that is. See the little hole right there in the base of the spine? That's the best puncture we could get out of that bow with a bodkin point. And a bodkin point was specifically designed to penetrate particularly armor like this. And I'm going to pass a few of those around, and we're all going to put this in perspective in just a second. <coughs> what is the distance to a firearm? Do me a favor and don't. Just break those out and pass them around. Um, we were shooting that at a distance of about, about the length of this room. And it finally took a crossbow to get through that armor. And so when you think about it, the European battlefields were an arms race. And it's the same arms race that's been going on since Fred and Barney fought to figure out who had the biggest rock and the sharpest stick. And it's going on to this day. But at the time, it was all about picking up different weapons and armor from different cultures, figuring out what worked and what didn't. So the chain mail that I'm wearing, and I'll walk around so you can look at it, if you buy any, you know, reenactment grade, you know, chain mail, you'll find that it's typically just wire that is butted together. There's no connection. If you look at this stuff, this is actually proper chain mail. It's butted rings that's got a ribbon on every single ring to keep it from separating. And why that's important is that this armor was designed to stop bladed weapons. So you take a weapon like this, it's not going to puncture. Okay? And it's also designed to prevent you know, slashes. Well, that's great. That's great for a guy like me who's going into hand-to-hand -in -hand combat with another soldier, particularly an English knight. But a lot of this stuff was developed, if you think about just the evolution of weapons and armor that occurred during the Crusades in the Holy Land, who were we fighting there? We were fighting in Yeah. Who were wielding something like this? You know, scimitars. Now, this is a cut and thrust weapon. It would have been absolutely useless against plate mail unless they were able to find a gap in the armor. You know, the same way that these hooked pole arms are designed to pull a knight out of the saddle, it's all about looking for belts and gaps and shoulder pieces and things like that where you can get purchase and drag the guy out of the saddle. So, did you find the Botkin points, the long needle-like points? Who's got those? There you go. Okay. These points cost one of my These points were specifically developed for this armor. Guess what? I lose. Because the long bodkin points, they were so simple in their design, but they were designed to take out a guy with chainmail armor. Because as great as this armor is against bladed weapons, it's utterly useless against the bodkin point. Fired out of a crossbow or a longbow, this would have been devastating. The other thing that this armor doesn't do very well against is mask weapons. There were an awful lot of these on the battlefield. You can pass that around if you want. That's a typical flanged mace. The whole idea behind the maces and war hammers of the period, again, were for chain mail. Now let's think about the cost of this stuff. If I'm a professional or I'm a semi-professional soldier, where did this come from? Okay, I couldn't afford it because this represents somewhere between two and five years worth of income to a guy like me. This guy would have ponied up the money to equip me in exchange for my loyalty. So instead of coming and knocking on my door and saying, you're fighting for me and if you don't, I'm going to burn your car down, he would come to my door and I'd go, okay, look, if you equip me, I'll give you my loyalty and I'll fight for you and you can train me and all this kind of stuff. And so we would develop a relationship, blue face, face paint notwithstanding. And so this type of armor would have been primarily for the professional soldier, what you saw in Braveheart with all the leather and all that kind of stuff, brigandine armor as I call it, it's a patchwork of different materials, plate mail, chain mail, scraps of leather, sometimes just thick cloth, padded things like this. Uh, a lot of them wore nothing but arming jackets. You would take the field and something that looked a lot like this, simple leather <coughs> that would help prevent, you know, you can pass this around if you want, um, simple leather armor that would have prevented against certain types of uh, weapons. And if you think about this, 
you know, this is something that's just stitched together, it's cowhide, it's cool, it's sole leather, and it would have stopped certain things. But again, it's not going to stop arrows, it's not going to stop crossbows, it's going to buy you a little bit of protection on the battlefield, but not a lot. Let's face it, these were brutal places. There wasn't a lot of medical. You want to hand that around? I don't know. I don't want you walking, sissy. You stay put. Um, there was no medical here. It's not like if you got hit with an arrow or something, you can call for a foreman and they're going to patch you up and take you behind the lines. It was very, very common that an injury you received in the first 10 minutes of battle, it might kill you hours or even weeks later. And so it was a horrible, horrible place to be. And the battles were quick, they were furious. Again, you watch some of the movies and you see this very regimented sort of, okay, let's send in this unit, let's send in this unit. And that did happen quite a bit. Um, a trained soldier like me would have been briefed on the order of battle. I would have known my role in it. I would have known exactly what weapons I was going to carry, what my fallback plan was. But the conscript didn't have that benefit. Okay, they were the cannon fodder. They were the guys that got the, they sent them in first to shock troops, and it didn't matter how many of them died because they were replaceable. And unfortunately, <coughs> any of your nobles, Wallace included, knew that. He understood the value of disposable soldiers. And unfortunately for a guy like me, you know, you know they, could, they could easily replace us. And so, pass these around too. Plate mail was an interesting evolution in armor because it represented, you know, something that only only the wealthy could afford. I would never have been able to afford plate mail on the battlefield. You know, even if I had picked up a piece of it off of another, you know, from a previous battle and tried to use it, it probably wouldn't work with my armor, and it probably would have been confiscated by somebody that outranked me. And so it was hard to come by. And you'll notice that that particular uh, those gauntlets actually have fluting in them. Uh, little ridges and stuff that increased the strength. The reason we couldn't get a bodkin point to go through this plate mail is because when you think about metallurgy at the time, they understood steel, okay? They understood adding carbon to steel to make it more effective. But this type of breastplate was hammered and forged and formed over a long period of time. And that process strengthened it substantially. So this is hardened steel, hardened by working it. You take a piece of metal, a billet of metal, you're pounding it out, you're planishing it into a plate, you're bending it, you're forming it, you're fluting it. All of this induces strength. And unfortunately, the bottom points were made by the gazillions. So there was not nearly as much attention paid to the metallurgy. They just basically took a piece of iron or whatever and they worked it. If it was sharp, it, was, it, it passed. And so it was an inferior metal. In that bag that I sent around with the arrowheads, I'm going to put it back. There was one point. Do me a favor, find the point that has the broken shaft on it. Um, the point that we tried to put through this breastplate actually bent. Even when it went into the metal, it penetrated, the shaft broke, and ultimately the, you know, the, the, the point was spoiled. Find it? Is that the one? Yeah. You see how we got a bent tip there? So even what would be considered a superior point was just simply not going to penetrate plate mail armor. So this arm race continued. You know, it was all about what worked, what didn't work. And so when you think about the order of battle, um, you familiar with the term Shiltron? Okay. It was a formation of Scottish pikes. And they would they'd be able to move, you know, uh, you know, pretty uniformly as a group and they would form a circle known as a porcupine or a hedgehog with all the pikes facing out and spaced in between the pikemen were foot soldiers. These foot soldiers would carry a variety of weapons. The English brought their swords and the Scottish brought theirs. <laughs> <laughs> so the claymore as we know it today actually found this form in like the 14-1500s. But leading up to it, this was also an anti-cavalry weapon. So when you see Wallace going in there wading through the fray, chopping people down with a two-handed sword, not likely. It was a very slow weapon, it was very slow to recover after a strike, and it would have taken a really, really big burly dude with a lot of stamina to wield this on the battlefield. This weapon, or its predecessor, would have been placed amongst the pikes and as the cavalry came charging in, what do you think this weapon was used for? The horse's legs. Legs. It was used for the horse's legs. 
The whole idea was to get that horse on its knees or on its belly, topple the knight back onto the ground. So, as a can opener, we go for it. This is where weapons like this came into play. These were purpose built for penetrating plate mail. Okay? They were made to penetrate. So you think about it, this guy is up on his horseback. We've just drug him onto the ground. And the foot soldiers who are typically armed with uh, their shields, I know you've seen these. This is actually something that occurred much later. Okay? The more ornate shields of the, of the later wars of Scottish independence, beautiful, but not typical of a uh, battlefield shield during the, you know, during the Middle Ages. Those shields would have been made either of wood or steel, and would have been covered with leather. And a lot of them had what's known as a center grip. And the reason for this is this notion of a shield being held tight to the body was great for formation work, like you think of Greek phalanx or a Roman phalanx, but you don't want that when you're out there swinging a weapon like this and there's all kinds of chaos going on around you. You want a shield that's mobile. It's actually almost like a weapon. It can be used to strike, it can be used to block, it can be thrown. There's all kinds of things you could do with this. But what was nice about these weapons is that they developed short range weaponry where if they could make the knight vulnerable, once they had him on the ground, now all of a sudden a group of guys could come in, they could pin him, and they could penetrate the plate. Down. So a 100 pound bow using a bodkin point could not get through that. But a light swing with this and I go right through it. If I really wanted to put my weight into it, I could put this beak through the armor, through the leather, through the lower padding, and into his breast bone. Game over for the night. But it took a lot of guys like me to take out one guy like him. Anybody want to see that? Pass that around. Yeah, they're pretty beefy. Another heavy infantry weapon. Who knows what this is? It's the lockup. This axe was also used, much like the, the French blade. It's got a distinctive hook on it. And if you think about it, anybody here into equestrian stuff? How, how tall is a horse of about 15 or 16 hands? Who knows? That's tall as you yeah. yeah, it's a big horse. Okay, so you think about that guy sitting up there on top of that horse, and I'm the lowly guy down here on the ground, and that knight is fortunate enough that he made it past the row of pikes. Okay, so now he's in my grill, and I gotta figure out what to do with him. Okay, well again, I wanna get him on the ground. This is another one of those weapons where I get up, I find a leather strap, I find a, a chink in his armor, I can yank him out of the saddle, pull him off balance if I'm lucky, because again, Hooking onto a knight on a horse is kind of like grabbing the rearview mirror of a pickup truck as it's driving by. So a lot of a lot of bad things could result from that. But if I'm fortunate enough and there's enough of us doing it, again, we get the knight on the ground, and then all of a sudden we've got him vulnerable. And of course, this in itself is a bit of a can opener. Now this weapon would have actually had trouble penetrating plate mail, but it would not have had trouble getting into gaps in the armor, the shoulders. A lot of people don't realize that if you've ever seen pictures of a knight on horseback, all the armor's on the front. There's nothing on the backs of the legs. Can I get somebody to follow me here real quick? Stand up and come up here. Perfect. You look like you're, uh, you look like you're awake. <laughs> so, 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 so. <laughs> Let's say you're one of those knights that's been pulled out of the saddle and you're fortunate enough to have gotten back on your feet. Now you've got your weapons, you've got your swords, you've got your stuff. I'm a pikeman who just realized, oh my gosh, he's off his horse and he's coming at me. He's got superior armor, he's got superior training. I've got to fight a little bit smarter, okay? Coming in like this to his chest, this is an archer's axe. This would have been the fallback weapon of an archer. If an archer's position was overrun, they would throw that bow down because you don't want to be firing long bows at point blank range. They are, um, they are way too slow to reload. Forget what you see in the Lord of the Rings. You know, they were lucky if they could get, you know, four or five shots off a minute. And so, with any accuracy. So they would have gone to a sidearm like this. 
this knight is going to be armored in the front. Okay, he's going to have a back thing on, and he's going to have armor on the outer faces of his arms and perhaps on the inside of his forearms. Where he's not going to have armor is here. Okay, so the idea was instead of you're not going to be standing out here and throwing a strike like this, you're going to be stepping into your opponent and throwing that shot around to the back of the legs. Okay, we knew where the armor wasn't, and so that's where we were trying to focus our attention because that's the only way we're going to bring the guy down. Any questions so far? Well, oh, come on, surely you got Jeff, questions. Just that the McDonald's uh, were regularly hired to go over to Ireland, and they were the heavy infantry that you're describing. That's right. right now, uh, because they would stand and fight to the death, the death basically, and regularly did, um, as opposed to the Irish style of fighting, which was to throw a weapon and then retreat. That's right. And they picked up a lot. I mean, when you think about, you know, that's absolutely, it's a very, very good point because I'm talking about the glaives and this weapon over here, by the way, this is a good example of what I'm talking about. Mercenaries were a very, very important part of the battle. So if you could pay an army to show up, you don't have to sacrifice your own people. This is a weapon known as a runka. Does it look like anything in particular? Triton. Okay, this is a weapon from the Italian battlefields, okay, and the English picked up on this, you know, much earlier. And so you think about the Romans, you know, the, the Romans were, were pretty famous for their bread and circuses, the gladiatorial arenas, and the trident was a very, very common weapon in gladiator pits. And so that weapon evolved into something like this. Again, an excellent, an excellent cavalry weapon, anti-cavalry weapon, but it could also be thrown it could be used to unhorse people, and again, it was one of those exotic weapons that a Scot probably wouldn't have carried, but definitely would have come up against it. And so when you think about the influences that mercenaries had, even if they're mercenaries from within the Isles, they all bring their bag of tricks to the battlefield. And so you don't necessarily know what you're going to be coming up against, so you had to kind of be prepared for everything. Now, I'm wearing this really goofy looking helmet. This is known as a kettle helmet. What do you think the purpose of this thing was? Is your resin that badly bashed? Well, because it's got such a wide brim on it, if some knight comes running up on me, cranking something like this, and catches me right here, what do you think is going to happen? Off. It's going to break my neck, because it's going to jerk my head. I don't have the chin straps on, but if I did, a good blow to the brim would be really, really bad for a guy like me. So this helm was not like what you would consider typical of a great helm. This is the type of helm, this is the type of helm that Wallace would have worn, okay? This was an incredibly expensive piece of metallurgy, okay? It was very, very effective against all manner of weapons, including arrows. Arrows would deflect off of this. This would be, the only thing that's going through this is probably the beard of an ax or the beak of a war hammer, like you saw earlier. You know, these were very, very hard, much thicker metal. Oh, wow. Yeah, so you're talking about something that the modern equivalent would be about 14 gauge steel. Again, high carbon steel. They didn't have anything stainless at the time. But the beautiful part about a helmet like this is it protected the full face. You know, there was not a lot that was going through this, but there's not a lot that was going through that, but one of the things that I'm worried about as a pikeman is the battlefield oftentimes was a lot of hurry up and wait. So I'm standing there, minding my own business, waiting for my commander to say it's time for us to go into the fray. And what do you think is going to be happening during that time? English arrows. Because these were not direct fire. They were lobbed. Yeah. Okay? So you've seen scenes from a bunch of different movies where the arrows are coming in and they all pull their kilts up and get shot in the butt. <laughs> the whole point of the kettle helm, it was an umbrella. It was designed to deflect arrows coming in from above. Okay, it's a very lightweight weapon, so I don't have to worry about it breaking my neck because of its mass. Pass that around. A typical arrow of the period didn't carry a lot of weight, and it was more or less a nuisance weapon. If it kept me distracted, if I was worried about arrows coming in, you know, the points that I'm passing around now are not bodkins. 
These are typical battle points, you know, leaf points, or, you know, you get some of these, you know, that particular arrow that you've got right there is known as a frog's crotch. Don't know why. Um, but uh, those arrows really were not going to be terribly effective against me other than a nuisance weapon. It took my eye off the ball so I wasn't paying attention to other things. So helmets like this, the kettle helmet, evolved specifically to be an umbrella against arrows. And where did we pick this up from? Where do you think the Scots got the idea for this? Flemish. Exactly. So this, this type of helmet was used very, very frequently um, by armies who often had to face off against arrows. And it's interesting how some of this equipment evolved simultaneously amongst different cultures. We also see these in Persia. And uh, we also see these in Japan. <coughs> so it's one of those things where you start to, you start to kind of see some patterns evolve where some really smart people back in the day realized that, wow, this, this, this works here. And, you know, these two people never talk to each other, but they managed to develop the same types of armor. So, how are we doing on time? Oh, okay. We've got 13 minutes. So, um, does anybody have any questions at this point? What type of metal did they use? Uh, very, very good question. Um, metallurgy was kind of an evolving, you know, emerging sort of science. So, who would you say was the undisputed king of metallurgy during this period? What country? Japan. Yes. Japan understood adding carbon to the metal and folding it and folding it and folding it, but running a so close a second that it almost doesn't matter for the Spaniards. Okay, the Spaniards understood folded steel as well, and so this technology again is another one of these technologies that evolved in different cultures completely independent. The Vikings also had an early form of folded steel. It was a different technology. They had different materials available to them, and they had to derive their carbon from different sources. But it was essentially what would be considered mild steel, carbon steel, and varying degrees of carbon would affect the hardness of the metal. So in some cases, like this, you don't want flexible steel. You want something that's really, really hard, because you don't, you don't want anything like this to happen to you. But if you made a sword like this, out of that steel, you wouldn't get that quality. That springiness where it returns to its shape, okay? This is critically important, because if I were to hit a guy wearing that, with a hard steel blade, a high carbon steel blade that was so sharp and you know, razor sharp, it would be brittle, it would shatter upon impact. So these were not just weapons that were designed to do damage, they were designed to block. And if you put a cheap sword up against a nice sword, that's what's gonna happen. Hold that for me for a second. That's what's considered to be a quality blade. A commoner would have shown up on the field with something like this, <coughs> okay? Notice the differences in the metal. Notice the differences in the manufacturing quality. One of those blades has a thick and fuller running down the center of the blade for strength and springiness. The other one is just essentially a flat piece of bar stock that's been hammered out. This type of sword is more of a style that would have been reminiscent of a Viking blade, okay? A lot of your Viking swords were very similar to this in geometry. And for every really, really nice sword that ended up on the battlefield, there were thousands and thousands and thousands of pieces of junk that, you know, rusted away soon after, and that's why we don't find a lot of, uh, a lot of the remains. It's very, very rare that you find a high-quality blade left over. You know, obviously there's museum pieces that were in the family. These were blades of renown that were forged for particular people, and, you know, these guys got to sit on horseback and, you know, sit in the backfield with all the shots, but they were not the guys on the front line swinging these things at each other. Most of those weapons were, you know, lost to the lost to the erosion in time, and so we don't really have a lot of examples of them. Pass that around if you want. Hmm? Yes. A fully armored knight. 
would weigh probably two to three hundred pounds. It depends on the type of armor. Right. Well, and, and that's, that's, that's a good question because um, there was a period in time where uh, one of the weapons that hasn't been covered here today, and it's going to answer your question, you'll, 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 it'll make sense in a second. One of the weapons you don't see here in this room is what I call an articulated weapon chain uh, maces and flails that have a handle with a chain and those weapons were entirely useless and mostly unseen on the battlefield. They had a very, very specific purpose. They were made for getting over a shield. So if I've got a shield and the other guy's got a, a, a chain mace, he can swing it at me and the chain bends over the top of the shield and I still get cracked in the top of the head. The problem was is it was super slow to recover and didn't really find use on the battlefield. Where it did find use was in tournaments. So when you had knights during the age of chivalry, you had knights going into these tourneys for the, for the pleasure of the populace and the king, you know, you would see these fancy articulated weapons. During that same period of time, they used a type of armor known as tilting armor. Now, tilting armor was a very highly specialized armor where the knight, once he was in it, had to be winched into horseback. Okay, and if he ever fell off the horse, he was literally a turtle on the highway. He could not get up on his own. That is not the type of plate mail that you're going to see on these battlefields, you know, in, in, in Middle Ages Scotland. It's going to be plate mail like this, which has some protective value, but still allows the user to move. Um, those gauntlets that uh, we were passing around. The entire suit of armor is going to have some fairly sophisticated articulation so you can continue to walk. But surprisingly, this is pretty lightweight. Anybody take a guess how much this entire rig I'm wearing weighs? 15 pounds. 15 pounds. About, about, about 55 to 60 pounds total, including the pike. Plate mail armor could have weighed as much as 80 pounds. Okay, now think about that. Um, you know, it's generally believed that they weren't as you know, large in stature as we are now. So if you take a guy of average height, let's say he's, you know, you know, 5'8", five, 5'9", five, and he's wearing 80 pounds of armor, and he's a decently burly dude, and if he's a noble, he eats well. So he's, you know, he's probably tipping the scales at close to 300 pounds total. Now, imagine what it must be like to come out of a horseback at full tilt wearing all this crap. Imagine hitting the ground wearing 80 pounds of armor. Talk about getting the wind knocked out of it. Now, certainly these horses weren't charging at full speed of horse. They've got all this barding on, they're a highly trained animal, you know, and they wanted to stay in formation, you know, so they were riding together at a, at a, at a, at a slow gallop, okay, because they just needed to hit the line. The total weight of those horses was enough to shatter a shelter. They're gonna, they're gonna lose quite a few guys, but not without, you know, not without, you know, decimating the, the, the ranks of the foot soldier. And so it was all about different tactics, different formations, the Shiltron, you would have had 200 of these pikes arrayed in a circle with great sword wielders in between and sometimes archers at the core. The Scots weren't really known for their archers, okay? There was a few, but most of them were huntsmen who blown themselves to the cause for whatever reason, or they were conscripted because they had to deploy some type of archers because the English just had overwhelming force of archers. And so it's, it's, it's one of those things where depending on the terrain, depending on the objective, depending on how many people you had show up, you would tailor your tactics, your weapon, your, you know, your gear to, to, to that particular engagement. And so I guess to, 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 to wrap this up, we've talked about the weapons, we've talked about the armor, but that's not all there is to being a soldier. You gotta sleep, you gotta eat, you gotta take care of yourself to a certain extent. Fortunately for these guys, it's not like going on crusade where you were headed off to the Holy Land, you know, a thousand miles away, and you had to bring everything that you took on campaign with you. You know, these guys were fighting relatively close to home. I think one of the things that always fascinated me was how close some of the major historical battlefields were to each other. They were very closely knit. So you think about it, you might have only had to travel 50 miles to go from this particular battlefield to that particular battlefield. Well, that's, that's a couple days march if you're wearing stuff like this. And so normally, these armies would travel with a whole bunch of supporters, a bunch of retainers, wagon loads of food, wagon loads of backup weapons. You know, there might be a few you know, surgeons in the group to take care of the important people. Guys like me weren't important enough to warrant surgeons. You know, if I was injured bad enough, it was like, well, it's nice knowing you. Here's some scotch. You know, so it's uh, unfortunately that's that's the way it was, and, and, and sometimes it's still 
you know, that way to this day. So we got just a few minutes left, so surely you got questions. Yeah. Why did you wear all this if you're on the march? Bugs and ground? Because you never know when you're going to get attacked. Because it was all it was all about strategy. Because if I could, you know, as much as we'd like to think that they sent out invitations and formed their armies up facing each other at a particular time of day, and, and okay, are you ready? Are you ready? Let's get it on. That didn't really happen. If I knew that there was a river or a bridge or a crossing or a fortress that I needed to tie up, I needed to take it out of the battle, I was going to start moving my army in that direction. Well, if the owner of that castle or bridge or crossing was smart enough to realize, you know, if these guys manage to make it there, I got a problem. So he's going to try to time his approach. We close? Captain? Uh, two minutes. Perfect. Um, He's going to try to intercept my forces before I can get there and gain the strategic advantage of the high ground. So I would be wearing this stuff primarily because I didn't know when I was going to get attacked. You know, it was it was one of those things where I could be marching down the road with you know, you know, a few thousand guys shoulder to shoulder, and you never know when the enemy is going to descend upon you. And, and of course, you know, weather being weather. Yeah. You know, nobody wants to fight in the, in, the, in the cold and in the rain and all that sort of thing. So they always tried to, you know, they always tried to give themselves the advantage. And of course, you know, taking siege engines and all that kind of stuff out of the picture, you know, those were never used in field battles anyway. Those were anti-fortification weapons. But still, taking siege engines out of the equation, you've still got, you know, pole axes, swords, you know, there's just, there's all manner of, of mayhem. It can be brought down on you know, you know, on these guys, and not to mention you know, boiling oil and flaming arrows and you know, dysentery and all kinds of other fun things that you got to deal with. And so these guys had to kind of be self-contained, and they you know they sometimes had training, they sometimes didn't. Uh, they sometimes had family back home that they wanted to get back to. Sometimes they didn't. This was the best shot they had for you know gaining a little spoils of war and. You know, maybe you know, starting a new career or something else. But you know, if they if they didn't make it, they didn't make it. So, anybody else? Oh, to the staff Say again. You have that little thing on the side. This? No, the leather strap. Oh yeah yeah yeah. This uh, this type of belt is known as a baldric. No, on the other side. This? My canteen, yeah. Because it's not like I had a bunch of kind people coming up to me on the battlefield going, man, you look really hot. How about have a drink? I had to take care of that myself. And so, you know, a soldier would typically travel with his own water supply, he would travel with his backup weapon, he would travel with certain personal effects, he might have food on him. And uh, here's an interesting little piece that, you know, this is about as close as it came to a medieval soldier for personal hygiene. Um, this is something that they picked up from the Romans. And so something like this, you would add a, you know, a toothpick, a pair of tweezers, and an earwax scoop. And this multi-purpose spoon was also a measure. It was a salt shaker. It was an eating utensil. So this was about as close as you came to a mess kit for a soldier of the period. So all of these pieces and parts went into what became that soldier's lifestyle. And all he wanted to do was make it through the battle and get back home. That was it. Anybody else? I appreciate your attention. Thank you.